counting. I want my life to count. You know, when you get a little, <laughs> I'm not that old, but you start looking back over your life and you think a bit different periods of your life that you're just kind of on cruise, and then t some certain times that you're really doing something, you know. I look back and I went to college for four years. I'm thinking, well, I really did something when I went to college, you know. I went to Africa. I did that, you know. And, so, and, um, and, and you know, we've been pastoring here for 11 years now. And I th you know what? God's done something. It's, it's, it's counted. And uh, amen. And, it, it, you know, sometimes I, I talk to him and I say, God, if it was just for me, <laughs> it's blessed me. Because I've been blessed as a result of just being faithful. I've, man, it's so... It's such, a, it's such a privilege to serve God. It really is. And uh, you just can't help but be blessed. Now, I want to talk this morning about that because, you know, if you knew what was best for you, the, the periods in your life that really count are the ones that you chose to do something with your resources in the best way. Amen? <laughs> you, have, you have different resources, don't you? Uh, actually, before I get into that, let me, let me just remind everybody, we're starting today with a, with a fast. Remember, we're responding from our, our sermon from last, month, uh, last week, and, um, and uh, today is the first day of that. I've, I've posted a little, uh, uh, little devotional up there already, so you can check it out at, at uh, go.myworshiplife.info, so... I'll, I'll post things on there every day. You can go back and look. I actually had a couple. I've been at this a little bit longer, so I had a couple that I put in there a little earlier. You might check those out, too. I think one's, uh, what is it, attention or, um, <laughs> I name them all, so you can, <laughs> they're supposed to be relevant to the, the subject somewhat. But, um, so, you know, we're going to go for 21 days, and so I, I, uh, let me look here. I, I thought I had something else in here. Oh, yeah, here. Oh, this is good. All right. First of all, I'm just going to look at, at Luke 5, 33. Um, I was reading this this, this week, and, it, and I thought, wow, that's kind of interesting. So they said to him, um, John's disciples, remember, who, who came before Jesus? His cousin John, right? And John had a lot of disciples, and, and he baptized a lot of people, told them to repent. He was actually preparing the way for Jesus. If Without John, Jesus wouldn't have been so successful. There were some hearts that were already turned, that were receptive. And you know, the places that he did the best were the ones where the hearts were already turned, right? And John did a big, did a big job doing that. You think, well, John didn't count. He just got beheaded. <laughs> he didn't do any good. No, he counted. He did what he was supposed to do, right? But anyway... So John had all these disciples, and, and we're going to just, I just want to get a clue on this real quick. Fasting was something that they did back then. Uh, you know, I was talking with Rick about this on, on Friday. You know, today it's a big deal if somebody's fasting. Oh, you're fasting. Oh, what do you think you are? You know, it's a, you know kind of a deal. <laughs> but we're going to. We're going to look at something else that's similar to this, but fasting was something that was a part of, of everybody's life back then. Yeah. And if you weren't doing it, something's wrong. Oh, you're not fasting. And that's what happened. Look at this passage here. It says, they said to him, John's disciples often pray, fast, and pray, and so do the disciples of the Pharisees. But yours go around eating and drinking. <laughs> Jesus' disciples weren't fasting and praying. I'm sure they were praying, and I'm, you know, but it wasn't noticed by everybody. But I thought, well, that's kind of interesting. So they were expecting this from people. What we're doing here is not something that's out of the ordinary. It should be something that's part of our life. Amen? We're just hooking up with the way. Th we should live a fasted life where we're, where we're saying, okay, God, what can I let go of now? What's in your way now? <laughs> you know what I mean? And Jesus said, can you make the friends of the bridegroom fast while he is with them? But the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them. In those days, they will fast. So you could, somebody could go back and say, well, look at Jesus' disciples didn't fast. We don't have to fast. But Jesus said, 
once I'm gone, if you're anybody, if you're going to fast, all right? <laughs> so it's a challenge to us, right? If, if you're anybody, you're going to hook up with us. This. Now, there's something that, that you will experience. How long does it take for you to change a habit? Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look at something here. <laughs> I'm going to pull something up. <laughs> 30 is a good time. 30 is, 30 is a good amount. If you want to do it for 30. I just I pulled up something here, though, because I, I Googled it, and it comes up with 21 days is what I come up with. Uh, so that's partly why it would be good if you maybe do some different things, but maybe get one thing to just kind of keep steady. No Snickers bars, you know, some, something for 21 days. But start to, start to let some other things get, get affected. This isn't about just doing without something and saying, boy, I just can't wait till it's over so I can do it again. Right. <laughs> right? This is saying, God, help me to become sensitive to where my flesh is dominating in relation to you. Because this isn't just about food for me. This is about other stuff that I want to get free of. Amen? I want to get to where I'm just not... You know what? We're, we're supposed to walk in love, aren't we? Well, love is never offended at all. Never offended at all. So that actually if you're being offended, if, if you're getting up in arms and anxious about anything, it's a sin. <laughs> it's your flesh. Wow. You mean I can't respond to somebody on Facebook when they say something to me? Well, that's your flesh. If you want your flesh to go hollering off like that, you can. Right? But you know what? That, all that does is mess you up anytime you do any of that kind of stuff. Anytime you're offended, it's messing you up. Right? And then anything else that we have in our flesh that's a stronghold, you know, you start to get, you start to get victory in one area, and, and it starts to help you get victory in another area. Amen? So, 21 days. Let me just read this. It, it's a... This, this is an article I got off the internet. Um, how long does it actually take to form a new habit? And this is uh, it's an article by James Clear. Uh, so this is what he says. There's a guy named Maxwell Maltz. was a plastic surgeon in the 1950s when he began noticing a strange pattern among his patients. When Dr. Maltz would perform an operation like a nose job, for example, he found that it would take the patient about 21 days to get used to seeing their new face. Up, day 21, they go look in the mirror and they go, <laughs> then day 22, oh, there you are. <laughs> oh, I don't know, that just hit me. Oh, no, that's funny, okay. All right. Similarly, when a new patient had an arm or a leg amputated, Maltz noticed that the patient would sense a phantom limb for about 21 days before adjusting to the new situation. These experiences prompted Maltz to think about his own adjustment prior to changes in new behaviors. And he noticed that it also took himself about 21 days to form a new habit. Maltz wrote about these experiences and said, These and many other commonly observed phenomena tend to show that it, it requires a, a minimum between 21 and 30 <laughs> of days of an old mental image to dissolve and a new one to gel. I just encourage you in this, for think, you know, we have to be transformed by the renewing of our mind, right? You know, that doesn't happen in one setting. And really, to be changed, it's not going to happen when you come up and have somebody lay hands on you and you get delivered of something. No, you're going to go have to walk that out for at least 21 days. Right? Transform transformation is not instant. Now... We become a new creation in Christ. There's some things that are brand new, but then you have to renew. Or you get bound again. And you don't have anybody to blame but, but you. But that scary person in the mirror that you haven't spent time with for 21 days yet. And he scares you again. Okay. All right. So I want to talk this morning, though, about what does it take... For you to count in another area. I thought we figured all the counting out already. Right? <laughs> Just me and God. I count with God. That's all I need to know. Well, I don't know. There's something else you need to know. Right? 
<laughs> you're going to have to get rid of some stuff in your flesh. So we talked about last week, right? And then I, I, I want to look at some stuff that's very important to God. What is the stuff that you count the most in your life right now? Now, in a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 way. What do you keep track of the most? What's coming up into the season where you're going to have to account for that stuff? <laughs> right? <laughs> this isn't something that governments came up with, keeping track of people's money. Did you know God keeps track of people's money? Did you know governments, that the more they control your money, the more they control you? You know what I mean? They do it unwillfully. But God is in that same category. Amen? Here's how critical it is. Where, what, what, th this year coming up, it's going to count in several different ways. And, you know, something my dad told me a long time ago when I was, when I was young, and I'm, I'm, I'm still getting back on track with this. He says, it doesn't matter how much but you need to be saving money all the time. <laughs> you notice this, especially with kids, because you put a lot of money into toys. And most of those toys just end up, they're getting rid of them for free, <laughs> taking them to Goodwill, you know, something like that. It's, it's end up, all this money, and you look back and you say, well, what do I have to count for it now? Well, I, I've, I've, I've taken care of people and stuff like that. But there's nothing to count for it unless you've been doing something with it. So I'd like to look at one example of this real quick, okay? All right. How many know when Apple started? The year I graduated from high school. <laughs> and this is kind of relevant to what I want to show you here, okay? <laughs> All right, this is another article I got here. Let me just read through it real quick, and I'll, I'll give you an example. Uh, this is really amazing. It's really amazing. Okay. Oh, 1978. <laughs> seven, 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 seventy-eight. That was the cheer. You know how they did the cheers back then, <laughs> right? <laughs> right. <laughs> And then we always thought it was so funny when the sophomores came up and they're going, 80, 80, 80, 88. I thought that just sounds stupid, you know. It's usually <laughs> 7, 7, 7, 7, 78. Anyway, okay. In the 1994 Oscar winning movie, Forrest Gump, how many have seen Forrest, Forrest Gump? Run, Forrest Gump. There's a short scene in which Tom Hanks' character opens a letter of thanks from Apple after his former military colleague and business partner, Lieutenant Diane invested some of the profits from the Bubba Gump Shrimp Company in some kind of fruit company. <laughs> if Gump was real, and if he was still clinging to his investment today, he could have a staggering 12 million shares in the Cupertino Company, worth around $7 billion. Fancydresscostumes.co Dot UK, <laughs> I have to reference it, decided it would be fun to calculate what that investment in Apple would be worth today as a way of illustrating Apple's extraordinary growth. How much of the shrimping profits Dan invested exactly isn't mentioned in the movie, so a notional amount of 100000 is used for this. Given the success of the Bubba Gump Shrimp Company, that's certainly a plausible figure, and it would have given a, the pair around 3% stake in Apple at the time, in the 1970s. By 1980, that stake roughly translated into 1,476,460 shares, which would have been about $43 million at the end of the stock's first day of trading. When the Forrest Gump novel made its debut in 1986, that fig figure would have reached $46 million and would have ballooned again to $91.5 million by the time the film was released in 1994. That sounds like an incredible sum of money. But it's hardly anything when you consider what Gump shares would be worth today. According to Fancy Dress Costumes, after accounting for two, 
more stock splits in 2000 and 2005. Forrest and Lieutenant Dan's holding now stands at 11,811,608. I have a hard time reading all these numbers. Get the commas in the right place. As of today, 2nd of July, this is 2012. Apple is trading at $591. That means their initial investment of $100,000 back in 1978 is now worth $6,980,702,880. Uh, $100,000 turns into if you invest in the right place. Somehow that money counted for something, didn't it? It's all, it's all where you put your money, whether it's going to count or not. So I, I just, I thought this was interesting. <clears throat> I thought I would convert that into s some other figures that we can maybe understand a little bit better. Um, $10 would have been $698 million. Ten's not very much, is it? You got $10 laying around? How quickly do you go through $10? <laughs> Hundred dollars would be six. Oh, what I got here? Oh, that that was six hundred ninety-eight thousand. Ten dollars would be six hundred ninety-eight thousand. That's still quite a bit, isn't it? Seventy. Hundred dollars would be six million six hundred six million nine hundred eighty thousand. And then one dollar, you got one dollar. Man, you drop a dollar and don't even pick it up, right? Sixty-nine thousand eight hundred seven thousand. Is that a lot? Eight hundred seven. Sixty-nine thousand eight hundred seven. And then I thought, you know what? My dad got me a Rambler when I graduated from high school in nineteen seventy-eight. He paid five hundred dollars for that. I thought, you know, if Dad would have just bought me some Apple stock, <laughs> how much would that be worth? Thirty-four million nine hundred three, five hundred fourteen. I'd be driving something real sweet. <laughs> How important it is, right? <laughs> I thought that was kind of relevant. It's so important what you're doing with what you got. Now, it, it applies to money. It, there's no doubt about that. God does not leave money out of the deal because you know what? Your heart is all wrapped up about around your money. It is. And so he, he's got something in place where he says, you want to invest in something that's better than Apple? You know what's more important than, Apple, than, than, than getting that kind of return on your money? It's what your life stands for and the legacy of your life. Amen? You know, as, as great as Steve Jobs was, there's some things about his life I, don't, I wouldn't trade. You know what I mean? Let's go to Genesis 8.22. So there's this principle with God that if your life's going to count with Him, He wants some skin in the game. You don't just get to get off with the blessings without investing something. Right? It, this isn't, you, you're going to be blessed whether you like it. Well, you know, the, the sun shines on the just and the unjust. I mean, this, the, the, the rain falls on the just and the unjust. There's some, there's some, you know, fringe benefits of being around somebody that does invest in the right place. I'm thankful that I'm holding this thing because somebody did invest in the right thing. But I spent my money on it. I did. <laughs> it's, it's not a, something that came to me. Um, so there's, there's, there's this principle that started in Genesis, right off the bat. This is right after the, right after the, um, the flood. And uh, Noah comes out of the, the ark, and, and there's, there's new things growing and everything else. And this, this is eight, Genesis 8, 22. It says, as long as the earth endures, seed time and harvest... Cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night will never cease. There's a principle that God put into place that if you want to harvest, 
you have to plant some seed. Amen? If you're looking for the, to count as a farmer, you better be putting some seed in the ground in the spring. Amen? <laughs> you, 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 don't, you don't procrastinate either. It's very critical that you do it when it needs to be done. Right? Galatians 6, not 7. All right. Where you invest, what you plant in... Uh, what you plant is where and what you will reap. So this is the New Testament reflection of seed time and harvest here to some extent. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. So here's the thing, going back to the apple analogy. You know there was about 20 years when apple was scary. Back in the 80s. And, and people that... I, you know, I just gave all those figures, but you know a lot of people got out of there because it was scary. Things were going up and down. They lost Steve Jobs for a while. <laughs> Things were not looking good. They were about to go out. I think I'll take my dollar. I think I'll give up on this because it's kind of scary right now. Right? But here's how you invest in something that's going to actually pay off. You act like you're never going to get it out. You just, you just put it in there and you trust it, right? So to get that return, that Forrest Gump return, you got to weather the storm when you're tempted to re remove what you put or to criticize where you put it as if it's not producing like you thought it should, right? says, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Where you sow is where you're going to reap. So, during that same period of time, since 1978, I sowed some time. I learned how to play the guitar a little bit. I did that. There's some things that I'd, I've done right that have counted. I've invested. But there's been some other things where I've had some attitudes that have produced bad stuff. You know what I mean? Everywhere you invest, you're going to have a reaping time. In a relationship, this is why I, I, don't, like, I don't like getting into verbal battles about anything. If you start investing your time in, in strife, you're going to get some back. You know, in high school, they used to take guys and, now, I'll say this, is it all right? It, like they'd hang them up by their jock strap on the pegboard, you know? And they'd, they'd do pranks on people. And you know what? When pranks started, I just, I got out of there. I knew if, I, if I'm going to do a prank, I'm going to get a prank. I knew that principle. If I plan it, I'm going to get it, right? <laughs> but there's this principle with God he understands investments. He understands the numbers. He counts where you put something. He says, that's going to come back. Right? And he's watching. He's watching. He, there's an indication of where somebody's heart is by where their money's going. In my Rambler, it was a cool car. It's a 1962, I believe, Rambler. It had bucket seats and every time I pull up to a gas station somebody would start looking at it because I don't I've never seen another one like it but we had some friend you know I, I got I, I went home and uh, one of uh, Scotty's friends took it out and totaled it you know it's like there's that five hundred dollars <laughs> you know <laughs> 
Whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to, the, to please the Spirit from the Spirit will reap li eternal life. Because there's a return on where, and we don't get around this. If we want to count in the kingdom, it's going to be connected to where we're investing our money, our time, and our energy. Amen? Because if you're not investing it there, and, and part of my example in that is I had that same amount of money that went somewhere else, and it did not produce, right? Genesis 14. <clears throat> so a couple of the, the, the main figures in the Old Testament that I would like to look at, I mean, these guys are the pillars uh, that really counted. Everything kind of pivoted with these guys. The first one is Abraham, right? He's the friend of God out of the blue. <laughs> You know what I mean? He didn't have no, he, he didn't have the Old Testament. He didn't have anything. He just encountered God and decided to believe in him. Wow, that's amazing. Right? And, and the thing that's cool about Abraham is he had this thing that God put inside of him. He was a businessman. He understood this principle. He was a farmer. He was a cattleman. He understood that if you're going to have more cows, you're going to have to breed cows. <laughs> if you're going to have good crops, you're going to have to plant good crops. He understood this, but he also understood that his blessing came from God, and he trusted in that way. Amen? Amen? He understood that if God said something, that he could count on it. It was an investment that he put his life into. Right? It, to, to the point where a good business decision would not be to let your nephew take all the good land. That would not be a good business. But something trumped his business decision by the investment that he had put into his relationship with God. Is that right? To the point that his nephew gets taken by a bunch of hoodlums. And here's this farmer, this businessman. He, t he picks up a sword. I don't know if he'd ever had a sword before. But he goes and he destroys the enemies of his nephew, right? And he says, this isn't going to happen. He has great confidence in who God's made him to be. But here's what happens. So he comes back from, this, from defeating the enemies of his nephew. And he runs into this guy. And this, this guy, the king, uh, then Melchizedek. Do, are, are we all there? Genesis 14, 18. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God Most High. He runs into this guy. And Abraham recognizes that this, he's a priest unto God. And he understands his position. He understands this guy represents God. This is an anointed man, right? So then, uh, and, and so th this king, he's blessing Abraham, saying, Blessed be Abram by God most high, creator of heaven and earth. And praise to God most high, who delivered your enemies into your hand. And what did Abram do right away? What did he give him? Then Abram gave him a tenth of everything. Did you know that the king tried to bless, tried to give stuff back to, to Abram? And he said, no, you're not going to do that. It's not going to be said that anybody other than God has provided for my needs. Isn't that interesting? He didn't give to get anything at all. It was like he just, he just said, here's my apple stock. I'm not taking it out for nothing. He saw a man, and he understood this principle that when you place something in God's hands, you can expect a return. How was Abraham able to have that kind of confidence towards God later on? I, I, I want to look at this because... 
this is an indication that this wasn't just the first time. This was a pattern in Abraham's life. Now, what was, the, what was the critical thing that took place later on in him? God says, I need you to give me your son. That's a little more than the tenth, isn't it? Is it not? But what's God looking for? He said, you know what? Until you're ready to give up that thing that is the greatest treasure in your life, invested in me, I can't really let you count for what I need you to count for. Amen? Is this, is this good? It doesn't sound very good, does it? It's like, I'm going to have to give up myself. Well, you know, Jesus said that. You're going to have to be willing to give up these things in order to be with me, in order to count in the kingdom. Is that right? Part of what I'm wanting to point out here, though, is this principle of the tenth was way before Moses. This isn't just Old Testament. This is, this is Genesis. There's a seed time and harvest. You want to get hooked up with God? Give Him your heart. And your heart's going to be your treasure. Right? Not giving God your heart or your treasure, <laughs> your finances. It might be that He doesn't have all of your heart yet. Is that too hard? <laughs> this tenth thing, this, this tithe thing, you know, there, there can be a contention over it. This isn't, what, did anybody tell Abraham to do this? He did it, didn't he? And this was Abram. This was before he had the ham put in there. <laughs> Which they weren't allowed to have later on. <laughs> this is a little joke, okay. <laughs> All right, let's go to Genesis 28. <laughs> so, here, here's the thing about the pattern of giving the tenth of the tithe that I believe Abraham developed. It, it caused him to be blessed more than anybody else in that part of the country, financially. There's a principle that you get into when you trust God with that portion, when you recognize that it's really not even yours. It's God's. Partly what Abraham recognized is there was a need in the man of God's life for there to be provision financially, right? And so he gave into that with an understanding that it was God he was given to, not the man. It was God, right? What he got back was way more than he put in. You're never going to give more than God's going to provide for you, right? But he didn't just get that. And we'll see this in, in Jacob also. What did he got, get? He got a life that was significant. This isn't just about money. <laughs> God said, I'm going to bless you with way more than money. But I got to have you at least recognizing that you're trusting me with that much, right? This happened, I, I saw this actually for the first time. Can, can I confess? Genesis 28, 20. Remember, Jacob, he's a scoundrel, right? He's hanging on to his brother's heel on the way out. And, and um, then he deceives his father to get the blessing from his brother. And, and, and then his brother's going to kill him. So he has to run away, run away, run away. And he's in the... In, in, the runaway mode, and he has to stop and spend the night. Remember what happens? He has a dream of angels going up and down a ladder. Right? Amazing things he's experiencing. He's just seen this, this dream. and he, he, Remember, he's, he's having to run off to his distant relative where he's going to be for 14 years because he gets deceived. What did he do? He planted some seed, didn't he? He got back what he planted. <laughs> so he, he, had to, he, he worked for seven long years in the hot sun and sand to get the wrong one. Wouldn't, you, wouldn't that kind of fry you? Man, that'd get you on Facebook, wouldn't it? <laughs> You'd want to hire somebody to get that guy. Um, but no, he worked another seven, and he got, he got the one he was after, Right? 
But he's on the way to this. He hasn't even, he hasn't even gotten started yet. And, and, and we'll <laughs> see what happens as a result of this decision that he made. After seeing the dream, when you have an encounter with God, it needs to change a pattern in your life or it's not gonna, you're not going to count for what, its whole purpose. Did you know God's already made prophecies over your life? And until you start investing your life, your resources into what God has put in place for you, it, the prophecies are brought to an end in, in your regard. Amen? We'll see this in Jacob's life. Then Jacob made a vow. What happens when you make a vow? It's something you hold to, right? And God sees that too. He says, oh. Uh, you got a vow. Let's see what you do with it. Saying, if God will be with me and will watch over me on this journey I am taking and will give me food to eat and clothes to wear so that I return safely to my father's household, then the Lord will be my God. And this stone that I have set up as a pillar will be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will give you a tent. This kind of sounds like Abraham, doesn't it? What happened to Abraham? He ended up being the father of many nations and never seeing a single one of them. Right? God blessed him beyond his time here on earth. He blessed him with significance. And it was not without the faithfulness of the investment that he made of all of his resources. Right? There's a direct connection here that if we're going to count on this earth, but beyond. Did you know that God wants to use you to impact somebody for Him for eternity? And your calling in the kingdom is directly related to this same kind of a vow. Are you going to let God have your finances? Oh, no, I just want to serve. Well... He doesn't have your heart, right? Oh, I just want him to have my, 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 I'll just give him, I'll think about him a lot. I need, this is the, this is, this is where the rubber meets the road. Do you really believe in God? Because when you do, it's going to be evidenced even when it's hard. In the 20 year periods when it's hard, you keep investing, you keep investing and you say, I don't care. I believe in where I'm putting this. What it does for you is it puts you in position to be blessed, first of all. Well, not first of all. I think second of all, right? But to be in position to actually be the, the, the person that God made you to be. Amen? And if you're out investing your life and your resources in something else and you're reaping something else, you can't blame God for it, right? Right? As much of a scoundrel as Jacob was, his faithfulness in this area brought him to a place that he could have never gotten just being the scoundrel that he was. Did you know that he went and he worked for Laman, his his father-in-law, for all those years? And God gave him the ability to be shrewd in business and to be blessed. And he left there a rich, rich, rich man. Right? And because on his way back, he had another experience. Remember where he wrestled the, the angel? And, and, and it, he, he bruised his hip. And he walked with a limp after that. And changed his walk. Uh, you know, just right now, looking at this context, I don't know if Jacob would have be, been prepared to wrestle that angel. Until he had trusted in God with all of his resources. You know what he said? Everything you give to me, I'll give 10%. Didn't he? In that vow? He became a very rich man. He never stopped. If he kept that vow, he never stopped, did he? He said, you're going to be my God. And because you're my God, you're going to get 10% of everything I do. Now, again, this is way before the law. Right? Right? But I see the significance. This is a principle in God. 
And God is a counter. And he sees what's going on in our life. The wonderful thing is, he's not going to... It's, it's like that passage we read out of the Old Testament a little while ago. That, that you can be doing something wrong for a while, and as soon as you make a turn, it's as if you never were doing it wrong before. Amen? I love this. You start getting on track with God. You said, you know, my life did not count. I did not give my resources into the kingdom. But I am now. From this day on, I'm going to vow. I'm going to give that 10% no matter what. What are you doing? You're saying it, it's almost as if you'd, you've been given all along. Right? And you can get yourself in the position where your life counts. Your money counts. Wouldn't it have been nice to know about Apple back then? That got hooked up with that? I'm telling you about God right now. Amen? 10%, that's not, that's not nothing compared to what you're going to get back. Amen? A legacy? A life that is worthwhile? I guarantee you, you choose not to do that. It's going to be going somewhere else. It's not going to bury. It's in, in fact, it's going to bring death to your life. Amen? Okay. <laughs> Leviticus 27.30. So I'm just establishing that this happened. So, so then it did, it did become a part of the law in the Old Testament. Because, I mean, how could you not make it part of the law? Let's see, we got Abraham, he tithed. We got Jacob, he tithed. Look what happened for them. That was a pretty good deal. Let's make it a part of the law. Well, that's kind of a simplification, but I, I don't know. This is a principle in God that you want to be hooked up with God. You want him, he, he, you're going to give him your heart? Then he's going to get 10%. What does God need 10% for? He, you know, he can, he can pull it out of a fish's mouth or something if he needs to. No, he wants to bless you. Right. Amen? We'll, we'll see this. So Levit Levit Leviticus 2730. I'm going to get through this. A tithe of everything from the land, whether grain from the soil or fruit from the trees, belongs to the Lord. It is holy to the Lord. Did you know that God's wanting to bless somebody else? And he's going to need your faithfulness to do so? And he's gonna, he wants to bless you, and he's going to need your faithfulness to do so. <laughs> Proverbs 3, 9. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing, and your vats will brim over with new wine. Kind of a consequential thing there, right? Malachi 3, 8. This is one we're familiar with. <clears throat> will a mere mortal rob God? Can you rob God? Yet you rob me, but you ask, how are we robbing you in tithes and offerings? You are under a curse, your whole nation, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if it will not, I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be enough room for you to store it. I will prevent pests from devouring your crops, and the vines in your fields will not drop their fruit before it is ripe. Then all the nations will call you blessed, for yours will be a delightful land, says the Lord Almighty. You know, I, I was thinking about this. I, I actually woke up last night, and, I, and I, thought, I thought, you know, I wonder if somebody's in the house. Do you ever do that? And then I thought, you know what? If I had a gun, what would I do with that gun? I thought, you know what, I, I might fire a warning shot and yell at them. But they say not to do that. They say to shoot to kill. <laughs> so then I'd probably shoot. You know what I was not thinking about at all? Was blessing that guy. <laughs> you know what I mean? Do you ever think about blessing somebody that robs you? I'm thinking, how, how are you robbing God? Man, he's got all the wealth. Of, you know, he just made everything. What, what's, how can you rob? The only way you can rob God is of a blessing, I would think. What do you think? Right? Because he spends very little time on the rob, being, being aggravated about the robbing thing and goes on to blessing. How do you rob God? Well, he said, it, it's the same way. I, I, I'm, mad at, I'm mad at Apple. I think they should just give me some of their stock. They have so much of it, they should just give it to you. Don't you think so? 
Well, they're going to say, well, did you invest? No, but, but you have so much, you should just give it to me, yeah. right? <laughs> no, the, the person in Apples could say, you know what? You robbed me of a chance of blessing you because you never invested in Apple. I don't know if they'll tell you that. But you get that notion if you go to their website and look at their investment opportunities. It's almost like you're a blazing idiot if you don't <laughs> invest in, in Apple, right? We're giving you the opportunity, and we're going to be offended if you don't. Because you're going to rob us of an opportunity to bless you. Is that a, kind of a correlation, right? As God says, you're robbing me. These people, how do they get to this place? They got away from the law and they, got, they started living in a lifestyle that was ignoring God. And their hearts were not with God because where your heart is, so will your finances be. Right? And God's saying, you're flat out robbing from me. You're my people. But you're robbing from me. Right? Okay, let's go to Luke 21. Ah, I got to get through this. Is this good? There's an opportunity in the kingdom for your resources to count. Amen? Not just for your resources, but you. It changes you because it changes your heart. Let's look at what Jesus is doing here. Um, Jesus, as Jesus looked up, he saw the rich putting their gifts into the temple treasury. He also saw a poor widow put in $500 in 1978. No, I'm just kidding. He also saw a poor widow put in two very small copper coins. Truly, I tell you, he said, this poor widow has put in more than all the others. All these people gave their gifts out of their wealth. But she, out of her poverty, put in all she had to live on. Some of the disciples were remarking about how the temple was adorned with beautiful stones with gifts dedicated to God. But Jesus said, as for as for what you see here, the time will come when not one stone will be left on another. Every one of them will be thrown down. It's interesting how Jesus was not so impressed with the amount as with the heart. Because, you know, some, some rich people will give a whole bunch just to be noticed for giving. Not really out of the love for God. Tax write-off. There's a lot of other reasons you might give. Right? But what was Jesus doing? He was noticing how much, wasn't he? But he's also noticing how much based upon who it was. Right? Was he noticing though? He's noticing. When it comes to counting in the kingdom, Jesus is a counter. He's counting what we're doing. Amen? It does not pass. He did, oh, he'll understand. He'll understand where I'm at right now. He'll understand that you're robbing him of an opportunity to be the one that you trust. Amen? Trusting doesn't just happen when the sun's shining and everything's wonderful. Trusting really happens when the storm's going on. The 20 years when things are up and down and everything's scary. What are you doing in that time? Right? <laughs> All right. Matthew 6. So this is Jesus again. Don't you like Jesus talking about this kind of stuff? He's your financial advisor. <laughs> you can go and have somebody tell you where to put, their, put your money. It'll be good. It, it could be good. When Jesus tells you to, it's not just your money, it's your life. Amen? It's a little bit different. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Where moths and vermin do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. You know, you take somebody, we talked about this last week, fasting will start to affect you in other ways. Investing in the kingdom will also. You can find out where somebody's heart is by looking at their checkbook. Right? 
for their cash flow if they don't have a check, but <laughs> right? <laughs> and, and the person whose God is God just will be just like Jacob. Whatever you give me, you got a tenth, right? And what it will do is it will affect you in other ways. When the time comes to trust God, you're going to be able to say, I can trust you because I, have con- I haven't been stealing from you, right? And I'll be able to trust in you. Why is it important to get in line with this? Because our finances are everything we're about. Do we want them to line up with God, to have confidence towards God? We hook up with Jacob and Abraham, and we're able to, our life to actually make a difference, right? Luke 6, 38. Now, when your heart's hooked up with this, then the amount does matter. Luke 6, 38, give and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over, will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. So, your little dollar in Apple stock would have gotten you... Whatever that was. But if you were Forrest Gump, you'd have had a bill, six billion, seven billion dollars. How much do you want to get involved in, in, in the kingdom? There's an opportunity. Amen? And who's, who's again, this is, an, this is an Abraham thing. This is something where God says, if you're going to do this, it's got to be something that's in your heart. Because being a cheerful giver is the way this works, right? A cheerful one actually is excited about the investment opportunities, believes in them. One that's begrudging it and saying, you're trying to take my money, that's somebody that doesn't believe in the ability of God to bless you in the least. Amen? I'd rather be like Abraham or Jacob. God, you can do more with it than I can, right? Right? 2 Corinthians 9, 6. I've just got a little bit more. Can you hang in here just a little bit more with me? <clears throat> Remember this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. This is on the same theme. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give. And this is important. What is your heart deciding to give? And you say, well, I, I, you got me there because... My heart really hadn't decided to give that much, so. But you know what? I'm not saying, let's see how little we can get by with how little our heart wants to give. I'm saying, how much do we want to get involved? Let's make our heart a little bit bigger. Amen? (laughs) But you should decide with your heart. Man, there's a decision in my heart. I really trust God. I'm going to give. Not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly, so that in all things, at all times, having all you need, you will abound in every good work. Abound in every good work. What that, that implies it's not just for you. Now it's for your legacy. Who are you touching? Amen? <laughs> all right. If there's ever a need in your life for God to show up, there's an opportunity in your life to start investing. Amen? You can have an expectation when you begin to invest. Right? This, this applies to faith. This applies to all kinds of things. You can see where somebody's faith in God is directly related to this. Amen? <laughs> the examples of faith over and over again. How do they get to that place? Not without the tenth. Amen? And it's not just the tenth. That's, that's, just a, that's just something that was revealed in the Old Testament, right? This is a portion that means something. And it's kind of like that, that, that widow. It might need to be the, to the point where you're actually having to trust God. Right? I've known of people that have gotten in this. We've got some people in here today that could stand up and testify about this. It's not the, just the tenth. 
you start pushing a little bit more. And, Whoa, there's some good stuff here. But get in. I've known people that have done this. I, I think it was the guy that did Caterpillar. Um, he, he actually got the, some, some ideas in prayer. We were talking about that last, last night. God wants to get involved in your life and show you some things in prayer that, are, that you will not get otherwise. And I heard this, the story, and I should have validated this, but I, I didn't think about it till now. But the, the, the guy that came up with some of the ways that some of the big machinery works got it in prayer. And he actually gives, or gave, he might, he might have passed away by now, but gave 90%. But you know, if God's blessing you that much, you can live on 10% happily. And you're able to give in to every good work. That's what that passage said. And God is able to bless you abundantly. But can you expect that if you've never gotten started? <laughs> if you've never invested in the kingdom, how can you expect to reap? And can you blame God for it? No. Now, there's people that will go out and in their own strength, they'll, they'll produce some kind of riches. But they're missing the other side of it that is so critical. The blessing. Amen? The peace that passes understanding. Amen? One more. We're there. One more. All right? Is this good? Yeah. Philippians 4, 17. You know the wonderful thing about this? I, I've been taught this principle since I was a kid. And Actually, some of the things that I'm sharing today, I, I, I wasn't aware of till I started studying them out, you know, a little bit. It's good to start knowing why you're doing some things. But I got brought up with, with an understanding of this. My, and my, to me, my parents are a great example of this. They, they moved all, all of us kids out to eastern Colorado where there's just a little town there. Dad never had a full-time job. But you know what? He was always faithful. With five kids... You know, and uh, we always had a new car. We always, as soon as I left, they bought five acres out in the country, and I guess that was the last straw they needed to get rid of to be able to do something else. No, but today, 80-some years old, they're not just barely getting by. They give into this ministry every month. Uh, it's going to... I, I don't want to say how much it is, but it's a significant amount. Amen. It's a significant amount. Um, and we are blessed big time. Yeah. Why? Because they were faithful in the little things all along. And God blessed them with a heritage. Now people support them because of their ministry. But they wouldn't have been in a position to have people get in that position if they had not been faithful in the finances themselves. Right? <laughs> Osteen's are a good example. John? Yeah, Joel, Joel's just getting the benefits of his dad. His dad was faithful in this. I mean, you go back and listen to John's teaching on, on this kind of stuff. And I mean, if you, if you want to... Get out of the doldrums and, and start living in the blessing. You have to start investing in it. You're only getting what you reap. Right? John's, uh, Joel's grandparents. John's parents. His, his, Joel's grandparents picked cotton for 10 cents. A pound? Is that what it is? I don't know. 10 cents an hour. 10 cents an hour. There you go. Half, and you know what? They were faithful. They were faithful all along. That's that's a, and John's gone, but Joel, and you listen to some of Joel's stuff. I mean, he he, he knows God, and he'll point you to God. He's impacting so many people. What is that? That's a legacy of John. Actually, John's grandparents or John's parents, I imagine. Where where, where do they got they got everything you give me, God? Amen? What came out of Jacob? A nation of Jews. Who gets the best deal? Jews. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? They're blessed. Why? 
because Jacob made a vow back then. And they got hooked up with that. You don't think Jews are faithful to give? Amen? Philippians 4.17. This is very precious. It says, this is Paul talking. Paul's encouraging people to give. And actually to, to give in to him. He's a minister. You know, when you get, this, I, I started to share. This is something I got used to doing growing up, was just giving whatever I got. I traveled with my sisters. We made a, a few albums, and I always worked a job growing up. And every time I get something, you know, you give, you give your 10%. You just get, you, and, and, and it's like you give it, and it's not, you're not worried about where, where you put it in. You just give. Yeah. Amen? It's unto God. And every time you do that, there's, there's, there's a little bit of confidence in you. It's a cheerful thing. It's a positive thing. Amen? You're, you're getting in your position to count. And you can do like the, the, the scripture we looked back there earlier. It said, God said, test me in this. Right? So God's saying, I'm counting, but I want you to count too. I want you to say, God, I did this. Now I'm going to count you faithful. Amen? And that's what we're supposed to do. Every time we give, it's like a piece of our heart is being placed in God's hands. We're saying, God, I believe you. I trust you. Amen? Should have waited till the end to have an offering, right? <laughs> All right. <laughs> Not that I desire your gifts. What I desire is that more be credited to your account. Paul's saying, you know, it's, it's not about you giving to me or to giving. It's not about that. I want you to be credited. This kind of sounds like you're missing out on an opportunity to have credit in your account. There's some kind of counting going on here when it comes to, to money, too. Right? This isn't just flesh. This is, but it is. It's connected to all this, right? What keeps you from investing in the kingdom? flesh right <laughs> so we talked about fasting li last week as a way of getting control over the flesh you know what giving is an also another way you got a problem with feeling like you got to hang on to stuff start giving there's a proverb that says there is that holdeth on to and never has anything and then there is that gives and has abundance Right? <laughs> Verse 18. I have received full payment and have more than enough. I am amply supplied now that I have received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent. What is the purpose of you giving into the kingdom? Because God wants to bless somebody. You know how God blesses people? Through us. Amen? Amen? So by withholding your giving, you're withholding a blessing to somebody else. Paul is saying, I'm blessed. I have everything I need because somebody was faithful to give. Is that a testimony? Right? And this is not an attitude of, please give me stuff. Right? We don't come to church looking, oh, this is the place where people give stuff. I, I'm looking for something to give. No, the, the, it's better to give than to receive. Right? Because in giving, you're getting something accounted to you. That's why Paul's saying this. I, I'm not looking to get something. I want it to be put in your account. There's a principle here. It goes all the way back to Genesis, right? Yeah. Um, they are a fragrant offering and an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. This is a spiritual, relational experience of people giving. Amen? When it comes to God... There's an element of counting that you never get around until this is in place. Amen? You're going to be able to believe him for some things when you've invested in this way. And you can always get started, right? And then what does it say? A lot of times people just want to confess this last verse. And if I just confess it enough times, some magical way it will take place. 
Actually, just do the other ones and you won't even have to think about the last one, right? And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. In fact, I wrote a song about, my God shall supply all my needs according to his riches in glory. It just repeats that. And it's like, oh, yeah, I like seeing this. But you got to do the other verses. Sure. Right? <laughs> it's and. There's a conjunction there. You do this, you get that. You, again, my apple shall supply all my needs because they're a great big company. No, they supply when you invest, right? There's the principle too. God wants to bless you, but he has a principle in place. Amen? This isn't, this isn't manipulation. This is God's plan. You get to get hooked up with, with blessing for your finances, but beyond that big time for your legacy. Ah, I like looking at Abraham and Jacob. They got so much more than finances out of it. They got nations. Amen? A legacy makes a difference. Your kids will see you. That's how I learned how to do it. I, my dad just did it. I just did it. You know? And God's been faithful in our life. Amen? Did you have something? Well, yeah, if you go back, let me just, uh, let's, can, we, can we just <laughs> go back to this a little bit? <laughs> well, that, that's where, that, let's just go back to that real quick because I, I didn't point that out. But it is, it is important. Malachi. Yeah, verse 10. Uh, Malachi 3.10. It says, bring the whole tithe. It doesn't say split it up into different places, right? <coughs> Bring the whole tithe where? Into the storehouse. And what is the purpose of that? That there may be food in my house. What's food? Nourishment, supply, things that are needed. In the case of here... What, 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 is the, what is the direction from the word of God and from the thing that God has in place that wherever you're being fed, you come and give, right? So that there will be food. <laughs> There's a necessity in this place for there to be giving or we will not be able to continue, and I'm not saying that as a, you know, radio, if you don't give, we're not going to, that's not, not but, but there is a truth in that. We're able to continue here because of a faithfulness in giving. And I believe that there's been some food this morning. Have you got some food? Yes, amen. amen. We've had good things here this morning. Yes, the Spirit of God has provided a meal for us. Yes. And I'm telling you what, what I've, what I've shared here, if you take it and you put it into your I'll, I could give you so many testimonies of people. Uh, my brother-in-law, I mean, he just, I, I traveled with him when I was, and he, he, he started off giving, and he said, oh, that's not enough, I'm going to give 20%. Oh, that's not enough, I'm going to give 30%. And you know what, I, I was just with him at my, <laughs> my mom turned 80 last, last March, and I, and I, and I uh, rode with Mark. He, he, got a, he got an airplane, he got a jet airplane. It's normally like four million dollars, and he got it for eight hundred thousand. Well, that still sounds like a lot to me. But you know what? It's the result of his faithfulness and giving. And there's a, that principle in place, and you just cannot get around it. God's going to bless, and you might have some other things that are out of whack, and it's a good way to get them in line. But you get this in place, and, and God will not be mocked. Well, whatever you sow, you're going to reap. And if you go sow somewhere else, sow some wild oats, you're going to reap wild oats. You know what I mean? And you can't blame God. Amen? Every good thing comes from Him. 
Yes. Phrase, and maybe this will stick with you. Something that our dad used to say. Uh, our parents, when they were uh, young, they were young, married at 18 or 17, and they started tithing, and then they put their faith out to tithe 10%, and then they started increasing and saying, God, we want to tithe 15, we want to tithe 20. We wanna. She said, Mom told me by the time they were young, age, they were tithing 25%. And I was just talking to Pastor Steve about this. I didn't know you were going to teach on this this week, but I was talking to him about increasing our, our giving this year. Ask Lord, the Lord what you're supposed to do. Because a lot of times we get in the mode, again, we're in that routine, and God may want to increase you, but he needs you to increase what you're doing so he can increase the capacity for you to receive it, right? So something that, you know, hinders us a lot of times is, well, I've got my bills, I've got my house to take care of. I've got my kids. I've got my this. I've got my that. Well, we all got my that. We all got my that. <laughs> but one thing Dad used to say is, if you take care of my house, God said, you take care of my house, I'll take care of yours. And that's seeking first the kingdom. That's really putting God first. Amen. And so you almost have to, sometimes your head can be shouting at you, you can't do this. But you've got to just be obedient, follow after. And you may not look good, but you say, God, you're faithful. I'm trusting you. I'm going to act on your word. Be a doer of the word and do what God's called you to do in the area of giving. We, you know, we don't talk about this a whole lot. Um, I don't know why, but we just haven't. And, uh, but when the Holy Spirit brings it up, I think we need to listen. Yeah. Amen. And I think he's, it's not just for our church. He's wanting to increase you all. And when we say our tithe, when we do our tithe confession at the end of that, I always, at the end, I've told you this, I always say, Father, I send out the ministering angels to bring forth the increase for every family here. They're being obedient to tithe. And so, Father, right now, we thank you for the increase above and beyond what we could ask or think. I don't know about you, but I have not experienced above and beyond yet. Have you? So that means we need to invest more. Amen. 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 Actually, I, I just want to I just want to say we do talk about it, but I, I think it's good to go through and, and lay it out why yeah. why we believe in tithing. Sure. That it's not just something that's manipulation or just trying to, to raise money or something like that. No, this is the this is the plan of God. And it's directly connected to your heart. Right? And I also want to say that uh, I appreciate what Buddy shares every time when he when we're receiving an offering because it's it's related to this. The, the, being faithful. And he's speaking out of, it's a testimony every time he does. I, I know, because they've been here all along. <laughs> and they've been just, when they're, when, they're, when they're out of town, they drop by tithe. They're going to be gone for a couple services or a couple weeks. They drop by their tithe. And, uh, and God's faithful. <laughs> God's promoted him. Is that all right, buddy? <laughs> but he's crying back there because it, it means so much to him, you know. It, it hadn't been easy either. You know, I'm fixing to cry here, so. Because <laughs> God's faithful. <laughs> you know, you put him to the test, and he's going to, he's blessed him. And he's not done. And he's not done. God's, got, God's got more. Um, but I, I, believe it, I believe it's kept him in his relationship with God, too. In, in, in some very precious ways. Amen? Because stuff has been accounted into his account. And God keeps track of those things. Amen? Keeps your thoughts in line. Keeps things where they need to be. Amen? And keeps you from going down a path you shouldn't go down. Hallelujah. So, what are you going to do today? Can we respond to this? <laughs> Can we, can we let it be something that we're going to say, you know what, I, I believe that. Do you believe it today? Yeah. Amen? We need to bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. Yeah. And you know what? It, 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 it might make way for some things to happen here that need to happen. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. <laughs> God's wanting to bless this, this body. You know, we need every seat in this place filled. Yeah. You know, we need to be inviting people in here. That's how they're going to come. Amen? Relationships. Bringing people in. So, I believe that's going to take place. Let, let's pray this morning. 
you know, every time we have, hear the word of God, there, there needs to be a, a reception of it. Um, uh, I, I, I was kind of, um, the, the scripture that I use for the, uh, for the devotional this morning is the, is the famous one for fasting is, if my people who are called by my name will, and there's, there's two things that take place that I saw in that is, are you his people? Yeah, I'm his people. Are you called by his name? Yeah, I'm a Christian. Yeah, I'm a Christian. But there's an if in front of that. It's not enough just to be that. You have to humble yourself, and you have to recognize that there's another way. Right? If they'll humble myself and pray, then I will hear. Right? It goes, it goes to what we're talking about right here this morning, too. There, there needs to be an adjustment in, in a heart that really wants to know God. The, the, it starts off with humility, saying what I've got right now is not enough. I need change. And I don't know. This, this is what fasting right now is, is, is about for me. I, I, I want more. I just want more of God. Amen? And I'm, I'm just going to do whatever it takes to stay here. It's going to be way more than 21 days. It's going to be more than 30 days. I'm going to, I'm going to keep going because I, I want what God has. And I'm going to keep turning. You know, in, in response to what we've preached here this morning, it does no good unless there's a turning, unless there's a humility that says, that is a way that's above where I'm at right now. And I'm going to change. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. And if you don't, there's a, there's a danger of also of rebellion. I'm going to rebel against it. And that's kind of dangerous too. That's the only problem with hearing the truth from God. Is when you don't do it, you're rebelling. <laughs> right? So we're all accountable now. <laughs> we're all a bunch of tithers. We're all a bunch of blessed people. Right? <laughs> Amen? Well, let's talk to God. Lord God, we just thank you. You're the God of Abraham. You're the God of Noah. You're the God of Jacob. Lord, you're the God who gives us the opportunity to hook up with you. To let go of a little bit of, of the stuff that we've got. And to enter into a realm that's way bigger than anything we can imagine. The abundance that is you. Lord, we thank you that, that in you is health, in you is wealth, in you is wisdom. In you is peace, in you is joy, and all it takes is an investment. All it takes is our heart. Jesus said that there's nothing that's impossible to those that believe. And Lord God, we give you thanks. Lord, cheerfully we give you thanks and are, and are grateful that you've given us an opportunity, Lord, to do something about our heart. To do something about our heart by taking those resources that our hearts are all wrapped around and placing them in your hands and allowing you to actually be our God. Lord, I thank you that there is amazing things that will take place in each one of our lives as we humble ourselves, Turn from our wicked ways, the ways that would withhold and with, would rebel against you. And, and to simply accept what you've said as if it were true. That you're the God who supplies all of our needs according to your riches and glory. God, I see hearts here today. Hearts here today that their treasure is you. Their treasure is placed in you. Hearts here today that have an expectancy of a harvest. An expectancy of a return. Expectancy of reaping where they've invested. And Father God, where there are hearts here today who have been in the, in the they've been planting seed in other fields. <laughs> God, you're, you're not wanting to condemn anybody. You're so much on the blessing side that you don't even hardly want to acknowledge it. You say, oh, just come over to the field of the blessed. And I will bless you 
more than you can imagine. It's not about what you've done in the past. It's what you're doing now. Oh, God, we're changed hearts. We're, we're, we're redirected hearts, Lord God. And, and now we can, we can be invested. And Lord, lo, many years from now, we'll have been the ones who've gotten in on the opportunity. And we'll be the ones who are rich beyond measure in your provision but in heaven our investment is not where moth and rust corrupts Lord God but our treasure is in such a greater place that will be represented Lord God in our checkbooks in our, in our investments in our time in our hearts Lord God hallelujah hallelujah if that's your prayer here this morning, just say yes. Just say yes. Say yes, God, I ditto for me. <laughs> you can even say that. Say ditto for me. <laughs> it's serious. But boy, as soon as you hook up with it, it's joyful. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Cause us to be cheerful givers, Lord God. Hallelujah. Cause us to be the ones that actually believe that there's a return. Oh, excited about you, Lord God. Excited about the opportunities in you. Hallelujah. We have a future. We have a hope. Hallelujah. We're grounded in a place that is so much more than Apple or Chevy or Ford. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.